wondering why I brought you here. You're about to depart through our flagship series, Dreamy Master Strokes. We've decided upon this name because we've extensively exhausted all other options and we've reached the cul-de-sac of names. Enjoy the video and welcome to Gamer Cream. What the zombies, dinosaurs, samurais, evil bobbles with scissors and mentally ill stalkers chasing you around in a manor have in common? If your answer isn't immediately Capcom in survival horror, then you are a functional, normal human being. I respect that, but this video isn't for you. It's for the degenerates! But don't leave just yet because I won't receive anything from this and the tax office will take away my house and my collection of Fabergé monkeys. Leave it on. Go for an excruciatingly long coffee break before you close it, thanks. Ideas and games can fall to the wayside of history in the mutable spoke wheel of time, yet they've all left their mark and while they stand now they allow the games of the future to run beyond. But there is one game that shines a little more in my eyes than the rest of them. What if I told you there was a game that in the list has won the Guinness World Record for being the first video game to sell over 1 million units for the Sony PlayStation 2 and didn't take the title of worst dialogue in a video game like some other lesser indie Capcom title? Whoa! This hall is dangerous! There must be a back door somewhere. Here is a little sprinkle on your sublime video smorgasbord experience that you are about to digest. What if I said this game is literally one of the first games to really elevate the cinematic experience of gaming and to utilise photorealistic graphics? I know that there are some hardened boomer players that will argue that something like Zork was the true gateway drug to cinematic experience, but those people are too decrepit to understand. Games with too many polygons is like literal body horror to them. A game that is more methodical and has influenced some of the biggest game mechanics and approaches to combat and gameplay, with a mix of the perfect combination of Capcom survival horror based in a made up land called Japan. Puzzles all wrapped up in a neat 8 to 10 hour package that you could just easily blend because if you're like me and my age, it's the only way you can eat soft foods. Then let me indulge you with a helping of why I would consider Capcom's most ambitious game ever released and what is left for the gaming mythos and why it's been left forgotten and why it was a critical pillar in the evolution of gaming. <laughs> Let's take a quick dive on what survival horror is up to at this point so we can actually give some background. Each of these survival horror releases up to this point had a clear distinctive selling feature from one another, which gripped players at the turn of the century. Survival horror genre can trace its roots back to the 1980s. One of the earliest influential games in this genre was called Haunted House for the Atari 2600, which was honestly like watching a video game being played through a pregnancy test, in which all I can assume is that you play a pair of tits getting chased. In 1992 we had Alone in the Dark, widely considered one of the first true survival horror games. Clock Tower in 1995, then Capcom again in 1996 with the huge release of Resident Evil, which is one of the most influential titles in the survival horror genre. All of these helped define many of the survival horror genre's conventions like pre-rendered backgrounds, limited resources, inventory conservation, careful decisions, supernatural and psychological horror elements contributing to a sense of unease and dread atmospheric experiences and of course tank controls. The reason why I'm mentioning this is also to show how ambitious Capcom would be during this time with the genre. It took confidence and innovation that a lot of the AAA studios are lacking now to minimise risks and to bring a consistent output of titles. Onimusha would assimilate all before it to create something new and refreshing to the genre. The year is 1997 and the gaming landscape is in its best shape it probably ever has been. This was absolutely the year for gaming. The golden child presence of the ever felt clueless and the evil 1997 fighting game phenomenon, Star Wars and the Masters of Terrace Cassie. Also some small no-name indie hitters. Indie games were pretty super big at the time, I wish some bigger studios would have picked up on them and monetized the shit out of those games because that's real art. Shame really. A team at Capcom had a dream. A dreamy team. They've just released one of the most iconic survival horror games the year before, it becoming a pop culture icon and like how Dark Souls is considered the get good gauntlet, Resident Evil was considered the how many times did you shit your pants and scurry behind your own bed covers game and at the time that would become the de facto poster boy of survival horror gaming. 
The Resident Evil team would now look for new ideas on how they can give new flavour to the genre. It's credited that Yoshiki Okamoto, a game developer who worked on Resident Evil and Street Fighter 2, had brought an idea to Capcom and suggested the team should maybe try something like Ninja House style of Resident Evil, where baby traps would spring out and kill the player, and combat would consist of swords and shurikens, ninja scrolls and magic and hidden walls and ceilings that would fall making you an old sandwich. The setting and plot would consist about the Sengoku period of Japan in the late 1500s, where all the Japanese states would vie for power and size. A sort of Sengoku Biohazard or a Sengoku Resident Evil. The game was originally aimed to be in the Nintendo 64 Double D baby, woo! But that was in scrap in favour of the PlayStation, which I assume was because of the space requirements of placing it on a disc. But PlayStation was much better with disc media. Also, the PlayStation was like the really cool kid in the 90s. It was easily the best selling console during that time. And people didn't have to buy a new Nintendo 64 Double D, which could flop two years later. Which was then in turn scrapped for the PlayStation 2. That must have been a rough period for the designers. I know that there is footage of the PS1 on Onimusha and from what I saw most of the game was completed. But I assume the reason was also because they wanted to believe this was like nothing else. They wanted to take the full utilisation of the new hardware capabilities of the PlayStation 2 which from the tech demos in the 1990s was going to be a quantum leap forward in terms of what you could fit on a disc. It was like 5-6 to six times larger than the normal CD-ROM. In comparing both the PlayStation 1 and the PlayStation 2, it's kind of roughly like this. The team would then onboard Jun Takeuchi as the director for this new idea. Keiji Inafune as the main producer and the main story would be written by Nabuoro Sugara Sugamara and the music would be spearheaded by Takahashi Nigaki. And I'm not going to apologise for my pronunciation, it's the names that are wrong, not my pronunciation. The fervour that came with the turn of the century and the increase of Japanese and Asian influence in the West, like anime like Berserk, Ruru de Kenshin, Ninja Scroll, Studio Ghibli and the release of horror titles like Ring and Audition, the release of Onimusha was destined to become a perfect storm. The team would create a spectacle like no other, the revolutionary graphics from the PlayStation 2 and the turn of the age CGI which would be shown off with the cinematic presentation of something taking inspiration from Akira Kurosawa's Ran or Seventh Samurai. The cinematic cutscenes of disgustingly realistic renderings of metamorphosis and insects, which would also become one of Capcom's biggest ways of showing off their kind of grotesqueness chops. This would show in thunder and scale with the story showing huge backgrounds, hundreds of samurai on racing horseback, which sweeps up to the main character who has been motion captured, MOTION CAPTURED IN A VIDEO GAME! This team also took inspiration from a real life person and plastered his face on the main protagonist. All of this has artistic elements of Japanese anime like Jinro, the scale and beauty and dance like nuance of Akira Kurosawa, the budding CGI which could be compared with likes of Pixar's Toy Story, large classical Japanese orchestral compositions that mirror Fumio Hayasaka. The clear presentation of all these things coming together would be like a mise-en-scene that has never been seen. The game also utilising incredibly detailed pre-rendered backgrounds so that they can also work more into making distinctive and clear assets like the characters and the specific props in the game so that you can get the best of both worlds and it doesn't compromise in the frame rate. Not only that, the pre-rendered backgrounds will also age better than rendering in 3D polygonal space like other games at the time. Did you also mention the feudal Japanese storyline that takes place within a prefecture castle loosely based on real life histories with samurai folklore in a supernatural setting? No? Of course not. I did. You can't speak to me, I have the mic. This blending of historical with supernatural and mythical elements added depth and authenticity to the game's world even when it gets a little bit wacky. The game is set in feudal Japan during the Sengoku period, a time of civil war and political upheaval. The player assumes the role of Samonosuke Akechi, a skilled samurai on the mission to rescue Princess Yuki who has been kidnapped by demonic forces. Throughout the game, the players uncover a dark plot involving demons and the quest to defeat a powerful demon warlord, Oda Nobunaga. Corruption, betrayal and the conquest of ambition of the Sengoku Jidai period and it offers an alternative history reimagining of the Saito Dosan siege of Inabayama Castle from 1561. This includes one of Japan's most notoriously notable historical figures at the time as its main antagonist, Nobunaga Oda. I don't know what happened with this guy in the PlayStation 2 era, but looking back, 
this guy got the bad end of the stick in terms of PR. All of the Koei games and Capcom games love depicting this dude as an otherworldly demon, but I think he's just a get shit done guy. I think he was just probably his work colleagues that painted this picture of him being like a demon to work for. Like, uh, hey guys, I need like a strategy plan created inside of Figma for the next up and coming battle. I need it by like next week Monday, and then like one soldier going, but that timeline is impossible, I, I just don't have the resources for it. You're such a demon, Nobunaga. Onimusha was then released for the PlayStation 2 in January 2001. Quickly it garnered a lot of attention because the PS2 was released when not long before it. So the collection of PS2 titles was scarce, but it was becoming a hot, hot biscuit during its release. Capcom marketed it worldwide and it quickly sold 2 million copies with just around 1 million coming from Japan. The game went platinum. Yep, uh, games back then went either normal or platinum. And by 2006, the game had sold over 800,000 copies within the US, which is roughly worth like 2, 10, 28 million dollars, with sweeping 8 out of 10s and 9 out of 10s from all the big gaming reviewers at the time. The game also won two Guinness World Records for being the first game for the PS2 to sell over 1 million units, and the first game to have the largest orchestra for a video game, which of course has now been beaten, but it held the title for a long time. The gameplay of Onimusha revolves around their action-adventure elements with a strong focus on slower, weightier combat and strategy. Players control Samonoski from a third-person perspective and engage in sword-based melee combat. The combat system involves combining quick attacks, strong strikes and well-timed blocks to defeat enemies similar to kind of games like Bushido Blade. Onimusha Warlords features a unique ISSEN mechanic ISSEN allows players to perform critical strikes and absorb the souls of the defeated enemies which serves as the game's currency. The souls can be collected through Samonoski's signature weapon, the Oni Gauntlet. Collected souls can then be used to upgrade weapons and consumables. The game also includes ranged weapons like the bow and the muzzle-loaded matchlock. The bow is pretty close to what the bow Ashigaru would use. Overall, Samonoski feels like a cool samurai dude with magical lightning, fire and wind powers, but I cannot in full confidence call the matchlock a ranged weapon. I would label it as an urban, semi-automatic, auto-loaded pacification policy. Have you always wanted an experience where you can just suck, suck, and keep sucking off demons where you suck them off so hard that the literal souls come out of the body and it makes your swords bigger? The kind of suck that would make Razael from Soul Reaver envious? In order to get stronger in the game and power up your weapons, you need to fully embrace this suck. And suck successfully! You want a bigger purple sword? Suck! You want to turn your arrows into flaming arrows? Suck! You want to turn herbs into medicine? Suck! From time immemorial, the solution to all problems is just a little suck. At certain points in the game, the players also control a second protagonist, Kaede, a skilled female ninja who assists Samonosuke in his mission. Kaede has her own unique abilities with kunai and hopping behind the enemies, but you don't get any access to any magical weapons that the main character possesses, but you are more nimble. The Onimisha series also has a plethora of puzzles that include lock mechanism puzzles, pattern matching, item combination puzzles, number puzzles, riddle puzzles, environmental puzzles. Even though it has all those puzzles, it has one puzzle that has remained synonymous with pain. The puzzle that has committed the biggest cardinal sins. A time sensitive puzzle, a time sensitive water puzzle, a time sensitive water puzzle with a checkpoint that's like 5-10 minutes away and you have to watch all the cutscenes on the way there. Huh? Hurry up already, eh? What are you doing? What are you doing? No! 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 The game also features challenging boss battles with cinematic moments and environments where players face off against powerful demon enemies. These battles often require skillful dodging, blocking and attack partners to defeat the formidable foes, but most of the time you can kind of get away with dumping all your magic from all the three swords into them and hitting them a few more times just to finish the job. Survival horror is also at the forefront even in the gameplay, there are not that many enemy types inside of the game, but each one of them is very distinctive with the design and strategy to beat them. Fighting them in extremely tight corridors or paths to force the player to have to deal with them, evasion is much harder than some of the other survival horror games. A full pacifist run is not possible in the game. The game demands souls, the weapons demand souls, and the only way to obtain those souls is to quench the thirst of your sword with demon blood. 
There is a little qualm I have with this. The game's progression also requires you to know which swords to upgrade because certain doors are locked with what can only be described as a benign tumour in the shape of a clitoris. Who would have known this was the location of it all along? Am I right guys? If you don't upgrade the correct sword, you can't progress the story. They eventually fix this in the sequels, but it's a pain when you don't have to spend another hour gathering souls to continue the story if you made a mistake. Finding through the castle, you can also find the remnants of the Japanese guards who defended the castle. If you're quick, you might be able to save them and be rewarded with items. Which helps a lot considering the game requires you to use inventory conservation to strategize on how you use these items because consumables like ammo and health can be tricky to find in the game. The game also uses mirrors to act as safe points so that your boy Samonosuke can freshen up. I wish that someday I would be that handsome that America can return me to a point in time. You can also suck at these mirrors to replenish your health and magic points. For all the people who want to show off in a 20 year old game that's only people who are eligible for retirement have played, there is a gauntlet called the Dark World. Several stages of enemies that challenge the player, going further deeper and deeper, challenges growing on each stage until you get to the end and rewarded with an important item that can help unlock the ultimate sword! One also great with this is that the game kind of blue balls you with it. You can only get the sword at the last 10 minutes of the game and to fight the final boss with, you don't even really get to use it. What? Okay, quick factoid, the game outside of Japan called the forces that help Samonosuke as ogres, and inside of Japan they call it Oni. In Japan, they don't call them ogres, they refer them as Oni, and the future releases of the Onimusha series, they've always used the original term as Oni. So, to confuse things, I'm going to say ogre because my accent gives that away that I'm not from Japan. The game is around 8 to 10 hours, the story is pretty much condensed, and the main character will become an warden for the ogres, Oni, who are the guys responsible for protecting against the demons. On a quest to save the Princess UK, chasing Nobunaga Oda, getting bamboozled across the way, and then killing the end boss. It's not rocket science, but it does the job. But I still love all of this. See, all of this, even in all its flaws, the gameplay just still pulls my attention, even after 20 years. This was like the first iteration of the game, and I still love the original feel of the gameplay and how it helped to influence combat mechanics in a lot of the games we play today, like Demon's Souls, Sekiro, Devil May Cry. We have the Samurai, the Witcher, Neo, and maybe even Metal Gear Revengeance to some extent. Fun story, even the game bugs influenced and gave shape to the combat system instead of Devil May Cry. The story goes that when testing on Amusha, one of the producers that was working on Devil May Cry saw a bug where Samonosuke flipped the enemies into the air and was hitting them. Then that kind of turned on the neuron in his brain to run back down to his own team and use this bug to build an entire genre on the hack and slash era of the PS2, which would also influence games like God of War, God Hand, and what the hell Onimusha, we are not worthy. Onimusha suffered from success, but here are the moments that I think it succeeded at suffering. So for this section, there is not a lot of documentation on the actual facts on a specific topic, but let's just use our imagination and speculation. Let's imagine for one moment that you are a developer tasked to be part of this team. One moment you're working on a Nintendo 64 Double D! Next you're told to change it for the PlayStation. Work on that for several months for them to go. This is real good work, real solid work, some of the best mechanics, gameplay, and graphics. Mm, real smooth, Jeffrey. It's gonna be a big shame when you have to redo this on the PlayStation 2. It's gonna suck real big time for you. Being from an IT background and working with developers, I can absolutely attest that this must have caused a lot of people to leave the company, which would have hurt the resources and maybe some of the features that would have been in the final game. Maybe we could have got an inventory quick switch system like in the remastered versions on the base game. Maybe we could have had some sort of romance mechanics like those Japanese Otomi games. Maybe we could have paid $6 for some horse armor. Not only that, the gaming genre market was shifting at the time, the taste of the consumers were changing. There were only a couple of more horror games that were released near this time and it was Dino Crisis, Code Veronica and Alien Resurrection and my personal favourite, Bible Black. All of you people who are like 20 plus maybe know about the series. Goodness, the mechanics on that game are good. It's a very coming of age experience for the player. I'm about to bust. But as you can see from the list released the year before, it really didn't have much going for it. The highest survival horror game that broke the top selling boards was Code Veronica at number 5 for a failed console. Did the team aim to get a participation trophy? Spoiler alert, it did, but it, this is still kind of impressive for all of the consoles. And how could I talk about the issues phase without also mentioning the translation issues? People, you need to imagine that back in this time, translation for games, especially from Japan, were absolutely... <laughs>
Games lived and died by the translation. Hundreds of games during this time from Japan did not get translated over or even released in the West. Games like Star Ocean, Bahamut Lagoon and the Mother series didn't even get the chance to come to the West and translated till much, much later. Examples of course of stellar translation up till this point are RPGs, fighting games, hell even a bunch of previous Capcom games. This house is dangerous. There are terrible demons. Ouch! Most of them can't even be chalked up to Google Translate. They hired translation professionals to help with all of these, but some of them, of course, became meme worthy. The translation inside of Onimusha is passable. Like you can imagine, a height restriction on a roller coaster, the gameplay and graphics presentation are the stilts it's desperately holding on to to get inside. And this was at the dawn of having voice dialogue within games, so it can be a little bit stiff and just kind of plain weird pacing. Sweet, beautiful, lovely, the dripping blood, and mm, what's this? Oh, a liver! <laughs> Let me tell you about the ways of the world, Yamamaru. The world? Sister! <laughs> Face me, demon! Who do you think you are talking to? I haven't seen one as foolish as you since that uh, Nobunaga. Nobunaga? Even if I die, I will destroy you! The translation has some wonky pronunciations, but I'm quite sure that none of these enemies inside of the game actually can agree on how Samanosuke is pronounced. Tell me, Samanosuke. We meet again, Samanosuke! Hey, Samanosuke! Though, looking back, I uh, really do enjoy the campy delivery lines and the translations. Oh, human? How disappointing. Also, let's agree, this team was like a C tier team in reality. The actual superstars of Capcom, like Shinji Mikami or Ayoshiki Okamoto, were either working on some new Street Fighter game that was struggling to move to 3D in home consoles or holding on to the success of the SS Resident Evil. Most of the Onimusha team did stay at Capcom and have a larger influence inside of the gaming industry, but I think we can say with certainty if the 1996 Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan and Dennis Rodman had substitute basketball players from North Korea, those players from North Korea would be the team in Capcom that worked in Onimusha. Totally outshone. Also, like I said, all of this is speculation. What Onimusha is, is something great, but maybe it could have been even better. Onimusha Warlords was originally released on the PlayStation 2. It was also released on Windows PC, although this version was only released in Asia and Russia. After the release of the base game, a reimagining of the first game was released to Xbox in 2002 under the name of Genma Onimusha. This version is for the masochist! The difficulty becomes a cliff. The game, instead of taking your hand and guiding you, grabs your arm, spits in your hand and makes fun of you. Then it rips off your arm and slaps you across the face with your own arm and slash hand and then takes a shit in the chest. This version also changes the placement of the important story items and adds new items and armour, gameplay mechanics like a way to become invincible and heal to help push through the new difficulty through green soul energy. The new enemies, one of which is just notoriously bullshit and impossible to kill, enemies can now power themselves up by fighting you for those green souls and do the equivalent of like double damage. A new sort of dark world called the Ogre Tower which challenges the players again, new cutscenes and new areas. I recently played through this version for the video and man as much as it's bullshit it's absolutely my favourite version of the game. The only way you can really play this is through an emulator because sourcing it is quite annoying. After this in 2019, almost 17 years later Capcom would realise they've left this golden goose IP sitting for too long and they decided to bring out the bad boy out of retirement with Onimusha Warlord Remaster for the PlayStation 4, PC, Xbox, Nintendo Switch which received mixed to positive reviews which roughly equated to like 3s and 4s across the board. The features inside of this one is really a massive overhaul to the graphics and some quality of life features like switching swords and inventory on the fly. But I'm upset that they didn't include the new things that the Gamer version had added, but I understand that this was mostly like a flavour project for Capcom to cash in on the remastering phase that the games and gaming were going through at that time. If I was to suggest a version to be your first playthrough, it would be this version. As of December 31st, 2022, the series has sold a total of 8.5 million units worldwide, making it Capcom's ninth best selling franchise. 
I would have loved if Capcom had gave Onimusha the same treatment as the Resident Evil games got with the new Resident Evil engine. I could only imagine how nice the game would look through that, but we can only hope and imagine that Capcom will reignite the series in the future for our new generation. Let's wrap this up. Let me explain my own feelings of this game. Growing up poor and not having money, this game was really the only game I had for the PlayStation 2 and I've completed it too much. I've come back to every so often to relive the memories of my childhood and to experience what it was like to be really blessed in this era of gaming. The huge paradigm shift of what no one really was expecting gaming to become and what it is today. Onimusha introduced me and a global audience to the rich cultural heritage of Japan through its use of Japanese history, folklore, art direction through the lens of the Sengoku Jedi period, character designs taken from the history of the samurai and the influence that the west had with the modernization of Japan, and with its mixture of the use of swords, bows and muskets, and the monster designs directly taken from Japanese monster horror and mythology, or influenced by it. The legacy of Onimusha and his characters are still felt and it should be felt because even though this game is just a footnote in gaming today, it should be respected for what it did and achieved for the series and how it influenced beyond the individual games. It played a significant role in popularising the action adventure survival horror genre and it's a cherished part of gaming culture and many hope to see its spirit live on in future gaming experiences. The success of Onimusha led to several spin-offs and adaptation. Samonosuke Akechi, the main protagonist of the first Onimusha game, became an iconic character in gaming history and became synonymous with the series. Like what Lara Croft did with the Tomb Raider series, Samonosuke's popularity also earned him cameo appearances in magazines and TV commercials, reinforcing his status as a beloved gaming character. Even years after the original games and sequels, fans clamour for remasters and re-releases in hopes that Capcom will don a new mainline title. But for everyone who played this game, who experienced Onimusha, during its initial release, it holds a profound place in their hearts. It's more than just a Resident Evil clone. The games were an integral part of their gaming journey and it left them with nostalgic memories of cinematic vistas, sweeping orchestral compositions, epic battles, challenging puzzles, and overall unforgettable moments that, like Onimusha, will remain etched in my mind until my own journey comes to an end. And that's it for Onimusha Warlords. I may do another video on the sequels, but that may be for another time. Segue into our cream rating, Onimusha rates as Ambrosia of the Creamy Gods, the pinnacle of deliciousness, I bring you Onimusha, a blessing worth 6 tubs of double fat clotted cream out of a delicious New Year's Gateau, a masterpiece in cream play. If you enjoyed this style of video then please let me know with comments and also let me know below if you have any memories of the Onimusha series. And until next time. This has been Gamer Cream and stay creamy boys and girls.